Please welcome Dr. Jeremy Dillamonger. <laughs> back when we're in the art of suffering? And I think that's a valid question. First off, I believe in story, and stories shape us, and they tell us what, what is true. And for me, that would be, you would talk about foundational stories. I, the, the right answer is the Bible, but if I'm honest, it's Star Wars. Right? <laughs> into the, what, what is good? What is bad? What is beauty? How do we relate to each other? And, um, all those things. So I believe in Star Wars. And the second thing is, is this. Uh, there's a phenomenon called shadow narratives. This is what my research is about. Uh, Pre-service teachers, people who are going to be teachers, that's my field, they come into teaching with expectations. They've seen teaching their whole lives. They've been you know, in classrooms. They've uh, seen a lot of images of teachers. They've heard our cultural discourse. And, and so they, they come to our program with these kind of rigid and fixed set of expectations. Here's what I think teaching is going to be. And I call these shadow narratives. Uh, from Plato's Parable of the Cave, much like Plato talked about, people in the cave would, would see a shadow of a dog, and they'd say, oh, it's a dog. Right? They're seeing this two-dimensional representation, and they're mistaking it for reality, right? for the full three-dimensional flesh and blood dog. And so this is what I think is happening with a lot of pre-service teachers. They see images of teachers. They see teachers from a student's perspective, and they say, oh, I know what teaching is. I've been in a classroom. I've seen you know, freedom riders or what have you, so I, I, know, what, I know what teaching is. And so... Uh, what I like to do is to analyze images of teachers, these mediated experiences, these, these lenses through which we do teaching, to understand better what my students are coming in with so we can help them maybe flesh that out a little bit, you know, put some meat on the, on the bones of, of the shadow. That's a terrible metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Yoda for a second. I googled the phrase, the Yoda of. All right, and on the first, the first page, this is what came up. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what happened to me. We, we have taken this phrase, the Yoda of, and we, we've made it mean the master of, the best at in whatever field it is. The, the person who transcends everybody else in this way, the Yoda of. And so our, our collective Yoda narrative is, is this idea that Yoda is awesome, right? He's the Yoda of Yoda. He's, 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 if you're, if you're going to train Jedi, this is the best possible way to do it. And again, this is Star Wars, right? It's, it's not that serious. And at the same time, here we have this image of someone who's excellent at training someone else to do something, and he has entered our lexicon, right? This has become part of our, our collective understanding of what is good teaching. Well, this is what I do. Right? So we're going to do a couple things today. We're going to unpack Yoda's epistemological and pedagogical assumptions. Right? What does Yoda think is true about the way we know? Right? And also, we're going to ask this question. Is Yoda actually a good teacher? Or is he a shadow? Right? Are, are, we, are we getting the, the, the two-dimensional version in Plato's cave? And really, we need to see the, the full thing. So that's my task. All right, English majors. What is this? Gary, we're here. You can probably tell us. Has so anyone seen this before? Yeah. Plant, you? Dr. Brian, excuse me, you do that, right? right? So what is this? So this is one of the first paintings that was trying to give, and I, I forget the artist's name, of, of the sublime. So this idea of like, you know, of course you're supposed to see the person in a painting, but the person is turned away, so we're seeing nature in its fury. Yeah, it, it's, it's capital R romantic. Right. <laughs> Ah. All right. So George Lucas in this scene, this is from the first Star Wars movie, Episode Four, and you know, Lucas is starting to fight with his aunt and uncle, and he you know he wants to go out and you know 
I want adventure in the great wide somewhere. You know, this is really <laughs> it's, it's what he wants, right? It's his Beauty and the Beast moment. It's, it's, um, yeah. it's, just, it's Ariel singing part of that world, right? And so he steps out and, he, and he's gazing off at the twin sons of Tatooine, and he actually heaves a sigh. He's like, <sighs> it's, it's, it's about as this <coughs> as you can get. Yeah. You can look at the posture of the legs for a second, um, right? And George Lucas said, this is the most romantic, capital R, scene that I ever shot. Mm -hmm. right? as he's, trying, he's trying to capture this. And I'm going to assert that the first Star Wars movies, especially Episode Four, A New Hope, and Episode Six, Return of the Jedi, are almost prototypically romantic. So let's just walk through this for a second. Okay, so, oh gosh, I don't know. Let's sit in the forest and look down at the ruins of the religious structure. Okay, it's Tinter Abbey, but in wow. space. Okay, it's essentially what happened. Okay. And furthermore, in, in both in the first one and in the last one, the rebels have their stronghold in the forest. It's this Arcadian strength, right? It's uh, in the the bad guys. They're the they're the technological, but strength, replenishment, good, <coughs> triumphing over evil it happens within this very nature-oriented setting. That's not active. These are romantic. <laughs> Ever there was a Baronic hero, Han yeah, yeah. Solo is, is that, all right? And, and not to mention the gothic sort of architecture of this shaft, we could, we could look at that for a second, all right? We have, what is this scene from? Anybody, Star Wars fans? What is this yeah, picture of? He's in the trench, he's gonna, he's gonna shoot his, his arrows, whether or not you can shoot arrows into an exhaust shaft is a... Uh, of course, my physics is very interesting. Yeah, really <laughs> but but what what does Obi Wan tell Luke to do? Use the force and turn off the computer. Yeah. Trust your feelings. Right. We get the voiceover. Okay. So we have we have this idea of emotions triumphing over reason. And so all these things are are kind of prototypically romantic in this sense. And this is Episode Four, and Episode Six is sandwich. So what do we do with this middle film? Because all, we go from this, you know, forest and paradise to nature red in tooth and claw. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have this, this is not an Ewok, no. right? <laughs> you don't have this in those first few little things. And we go from life-giving nature to literally, you know, your tauntaun will freeze before you reach the first marker. <laughs> we're cutting open, you know, and smelling out of intestines. Yeah. <laughs> And I thought they smelled trees, bad on the outside. Right? This is what we've got. Because we, we've gone from, you know, the Yavin and the forest moon of Indoor to swamp and mire and decay and things that eat our droids. You know, and it's, it's a very different movie. And so, talking between these two romantic films, you have this something else happening. And I'm going to start that you can really see this in the way that Jedi are trained. And the, the difference between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Romantic versus enlightenment pedagogy. Okay. So uh, here's a scene. This is from, um, they're on the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars, and Luke is trying to fight off that little floating ball that's shooting lasers at him, and he's failing miserably. And so Obi Wan says, uh, he gives Luke a helmet. It's got the, the visor on it. He says, uh, let go of your conscious self and act on instinct. And Luke, being a whiny, he goes, when the blood is shield down, I can't even see. How am I supposed to fight? And Obi Wan says, Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. Stretch out with your feelings. Okay, so this, I mean, we're now, it's one little scene, right? But this is what we academics do. We pick up on one little thing and we <laughs> pull it to pieces. So this is essentially uh, Rousseau. Okay, this is Jean Jacques Rousseau, a French uh, romantic philosopher who spoke, actually wrote a book about education. How then should we educate? And it was how should we should educate boys. It's quite specifically, he didn't really think we should educate girls, but. That's a different issue. So, <laughs> he, uh, he believed that mankind, human beings, are naturally good. And because we are naturally good, he would say we're, we're, man is born free, and uh, it's everywhere else he gets in chains. So society corrupts us. And what a teacher's job is to just create a situation, basically the fertile soil in which the student can grow. Get out of the way. Water the ground every now and then. But all, everything the student needs is already inside the student. We get the word kindergarten from this idea. It's literally a garden where children grow. It's a very romantic idea. And so uh, he believed in innate knowledge. Again, teacher's job is not to fill your head. Teacher's job is to create the conditions and then to 
just step aside. And the child will flourish on his own. Not her own, he didn't believe that, but on his own, he will flourish. So it's hands-on, it's very informal. And uh, this is really important here. Yeah, Rousseau said, the world of reality has its limits, right? It's the world of imagination. It's boundless. It's that, that distant horizon with the mists and the mountains. Right? That's, that's, uh, that's Rousseau's that's bag there. So if you look back at this, this interaction here, you can see, I, I put some of some red, I'm not sure it's showing up very well. So act on instinct. <coughs> Don't reason your way through this. Just feel, whatever's natural, whatever comes out spontaneously. That is, well, that's how you learn. That's the right response. Your eyes, well, we don't trust the empirical. Your eyes can deceive you. Okay, because we're, we're not, we're about uh, the feelings, not about the reason, not about empirical data. We don't, we don't go there. So this is Rousseau. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi. And Luke is very happy, and Obi-Wan's very encouraging. See, you've just taken your first step into a larger world. I'm proud of you. And it's all very uplifting. And then there's this. <laughs> Look, I'm sure it's delicious. I just don't understand why we can't see Yoda now. Patience! When I did that, it just turned to eat as well. you is wrong. Right, so let's talk about John Locke. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
he, he's, he's like the mirror or the inverse image, reverse image of, of Rousseau in a sense. Uh, mankind, human beings are naturally corrupt. And instead of us being naturally good and are corrupted by society, Locke would have preached that we are naturally <coughs> corrupt and we are civilized by society. Society is the civilizing influence. It's laws, it's rules, it's discipline that bring us into order as opposed to the things that inhibit us, they're the things that actually free us. It's a very different idea. Uh, he believed that, uh, in terms of epistemologically, that uh, people are tabula rasa, blank slates, that we don't come with any innate knowledge. It's only through experience, it's only through, having, through living that we gain an understanding or, or knowledge about the world, which is, again, very different from Rousseau, who said, just get out of the way, right? And what is inside the student will come out and grow. And, you know, formal education. He did also believe that imagination was limited to that which can be empirically sensed. So, if you think about art at the time, Gary was just talking about this a second ago, uh, Enlightenment art was photorealism, right? It, was, it, it looked as, it was as representational as it could possibly be, whereas romantic art, as we saw that, the, it's, it's got this uh, fancy to it, and, and this imagination, and this, the mind's eye, as opposed to the literal sensory organs that we have here. So if you look at Yoda, it's talking about, so he has no patience, there's anger in him, right? The stuff inside you, not good, it's wrong. What do you know of right you don't, you don't bring anything to the table, Luke. Or if you do, it's bad. <laughs> okay, look, all his life has he looked away to the future, or to the horizon, much like that. And that's a bad thing, according to Yoda. Whereas according to, you know, the first film, that's what Luke is, is what we want. He's our hero. That's what we know he's the hero, right? Never his mind on where he was, what he was doing. And then, of course, this thing, oh, yeah, he'll be afraid. Right? That, that fear idea doesn't show up very much in the romantic, not in Ben Kenobi's version. So this is essentially what I think you were just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, which makes you think this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's really kind of like hyper-Calvinist sort of like... <laughs> and uh, my wife is like, what are you doing? And I was like, that's so I lost that. <laughs> so I, I tried to, to pare this down. So here's, here's um, Yoda's verse. Here's his assumptions about... Right, we bring nothing to the table. There's no student autonomy in Yoda's world. You don't get to decide. You have no input. Right. Yeah. My own counsel will I keep on who is to be trained. Uh, Veneration of empirical reason. It's all reason. No, no you don't think about that thing out there. Keep your mind here on what you're doing now. And there's no grace. It's, it's entirely corrupt. Okay, so the Ben Kenobi version. It's the romantic version is, you know, well, yeah, you, you come with a priori knowledge, right? this any knowledge. It's total autonomy. It's kind of whatever you want to do. Uh, we don't trust our senses. You know, we go with our feelings. And there's no sin in that world. So we have, on one hand, we have this version, right? The bench, which is very appealing, right? It, it, it does, it's tempting, it's alluring. I, I would assert, it, this is as false as, as the pure Yoda version. Mm -hmm. Because, if you go back a slide here, this is this, right? Students, I think, do come with some knowledge, but they don't know everything. Uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that, right? Either extreme is a distortion. Either extreme is a shadow. When, when, we, look at, when we look at education through either this or this, it's, it's a two-dimensional version uh, of this thick and full-bodied reality. So uh, I assert what we need in education uh, 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 is some sort of blend to bring balance to the force, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> I could not bring myself to put up a picture of Anakin Skywalker in here. So we're, we're going to call this like a celebrity couple meme. Yoni War. <laughs> 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 I, I was, if we're looking at, at film or at Yoda as this prototypical master teacher, I, we could do better than that. 
So what we need is the Yodi rule. So from now on, your commitment to your education is to go out and say, well, he's actually not the Yoda of whatever, he's the Yodi one. <laughs> and to endure the quizzical <laughs> So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh. <laughs> Any questions? Star Wars every year at yeah. this conference, just on <laughs> principle alone. Um, but, uh, but when did this? So I teach. This is actually, believe it or not, not with Empire Strikes Back, but representations of teachers in, in mass media and the way that teachers are, uh, the way that they influence um, people's expectations, understanding is actually my field of study. So I teach a class on um, Hollywood representations of teachers, uh, for example, and, and I usually use teacher movies, you know. Dead Poet Society, etc. But uh, so this idea has been kind of bouncing around in my head for a while. But it wasn't until uh, Dr. Rebsler put out a call for papers that I, I started thinking about how could I incorporate this new Star Wars. And this yeah. Yes, sir. Is there a um, Darth Vader Kylo Ren sequel for this? <laughs> um, I, I, I only saw uh, The Force Awakens twice in one day. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of those times with Dr. Webster, actually, it was just, uh, so I, I'm not familiar enough with it yet. I think the next one, I think episode eight, where, where Ray is actually in training with Luke will be very interesting to take and compare and see, see where, where this goes. I mean, how are they going to, what does good education look like in the Star Wars universe? We now have two very different versions of it, neither of which I think are actually accurate, but, yeah. Yes? Um. claim a little bit of ignorance on that. I, my study has been about representations of teachers mm -hmm. and of classroom behaviors, and I haven't looked, as, I've looked a little bit at how are students depicted. Mm -hmm. I, I do know that there is a sort of a, an archetypal uh, sort of a trajectory to student-teacher interaction, so it's gonna come in where students are uh, disruptive and dismissive of the teacher, and the teacher will come in and they'll struggle for a while, and the teacher will win the students over, and by the end of the, the film, the students are sitting adorably at the teacher's feet, and, as the teacher has um, become the only one in that world who cares about them, right? The administrators never care, so it's always, it's always my teacher. But um, I've not looked for that kind of dichotomy in, in representation of students. I think in real life, my experience has been that there are some students who really, really want the affirmation of them as unique and special individuals, mm -hmm. and some students who just want to get to work, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, and I don't know if that's it has anything to do with depiction or, or just natural tendencies. I, I couldn't say. Mm -hmm. I have experienced some of that, but I've never researched it per se. So maybe you've inspired something. I don't know. That's very interesting. Anything else? Okay, thank you. May the force be with you.